people that collect records, they understand a record, looking at a record, it's more than just a record. It's like a photograph, or it's, it's a memory. You know where you were, the friends you were with, the day that you had, all that stuff goes into it. You know, it's more than just music. It's more than just the message of the words on the vinyl. There's so much more, at least that's true with me, and I'm sure it's true with most people too. I've been doing Doctor Strange since 1988 out of my apartment. I started out of my apartment, which was right down the street, then moved to a house, which was also right down the street, and still is. And then the store, the physical store, opened up. October will be 17 years. Me and my mom went for a drive, just killing time as a, as a child. And right across the street, there was an old thrift store. We just happened to drive up Amethyst, which were on Amethyst as a kid, and went to this thrift store. And then all these years later, when I was looking for a storefront to open up, just something in my head pulled me towards this area. Like, and I, you know, I've been here for 30 years, and I still have never been on this street until I found this store. There's no reason to go on this street. It's, it's an old part of town. There's nothing here. And I was looking around the city, looking for places to rent, um, you know, to open up Doctor Strange. And then something just clicked in my head, like. It kind of drew me towards this street, and I drove up the street, and this building was for sale. I guess things are meant to happen, you know. I'm not making that up. It's 100% it's true. And I actually found it. It's been like 40 years since I was on that street. It's just weird, yeah. It's the first post office. It's uh, 109 years old. has a lot of history. This was downtown Alta Loma. This was a general store, and then later turned into the post office. And now it's Doctor Strange. Pretty much only punk rock. I mean, there's metal, some metal, some reggae, some new wave, ska, but for the most part, it's 90% punk rock, and that's just because that's what I really like. You know, I'm not gonna sell things that I don't like. No rock and roll, no hip hop. I just don't like that music. Um, I only, only sell what I really enjoy and what I have a passion for, and that's the reason I think I'm still here 27 years later. You know, a lot of people say, well, what's punk? And you can be a businessman or a lawyer and still be a punk. It's holding true to your ethics and your values and your morals. That's what punk is to me. And you could ask someone else and someone might say, oh, it's getting drunk and fucking up society. And that's not what it's about to me. To me, it's about making society better. You know, it depends on whose definition, but basically treating people the way you want to be treated. And for the most part, that's who comes here. People get that. But your personal definition of, of what punk is, it's, that's your own personal definition. But for me, it's just being the best person you can be. Always trying. No one's perfect. The label, you know, starting off, I, I paid for it with a credit card, which got me in trouble because I maxed it out, you know. I bought, it took me years to pay that off. I don't regret it, but I, you know, I did it. Um, and then during the 90s, Doctor Strange really took off. I mean, anything I put out would sell tens of thousands. When, when I did a release, I did vinyl, CD, and cassette. I did all three formats. And they all sold just because it was on Doctor Strange, which was really super cool. It was good music. You know, like I did Narcoleptic Youth. They're kind of a local band. They're kind of spread out, but they're in Southern California. They're new, awesome band. They still play all the time. Uh, the Freeze, which is an old, one of Boston's first punk bands. They started in 78, um, doing new stuff of theirs. Threats, which is one of my favorite bands, another one of the first Scottish bands. Um, the, well, the Threats broke up, now they're doing Jim Threat and the Vultures. It's the singer of the Threats. Similar, but not the same, but really super good stuff. So, yeah, I mean, I'm still doing it just for fun. 
I don't expect to make money on it. If, if I can break even, that's fine. If not, that's okay too. About a really rare, the most I ever paid for a record was a Dickies record, it was a hundred bucks, which I kind of look down upon people doing that, unless you're really into the, I don't like people, I call them trophy hunters. If you're into the band, if you're into the record, spend a thousand bucks. Those, you know, that's, that's fine. But if you just want to get it and you never want to play it and you want to show it to your friends just to rub it in their face, then screw you, I, I hate that mentality. But the Dickies, like I said, that's just about my favorite band. It's a really rare Portuguese pressing. Um, only made 500 of them. I bought it from a friend in Scotland. So that's probably, I couldn't pick one record that's like the most valuable or emotional, you know, to me, but that's one of them. Now, that one always comes to mind. When the store opened, like the physical store opened, I stopped collecting records because I knew, because I had that bug. I still do. I'm like a recovering, not alcoholic, recovering audiophile or you know and I figure if I don't you know stop I'll go out of business I still get that high because I tell myself every record in here is mine it's part of my collection but I still get that high like if you walk in and you know like, oh you asked for a record you're not gonna have it they'll ask anyway it's some crazy rare record and you have it and the look on your face is like it makes me feel because I can totally relate to that and I still get that, that buzz that addiction fix when I see a customer get excited about a record that they've been looking for for years.